uh, welcome to this uh, very important and interactive lecture. Once again, I want to thank Fering uh, for helping us uh, have a very good speaker with us who would be addressing a very important issue of how to supplement the LH activity. You have uh, HMGs, which are HCG, you have LH uh, recombinant available. We use both of them. So it will be a very important thing for all of, uh, all of us to understand what are the basic differences and which one or which product or which compound molecule is better for your patients to improve outcomes. So I would like to invite Dr. Amol from Fering to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Peter Plantu. He's from Brussels, Belgium. And as a routine, we'll have a survey poll before the presentation. And then uh, with the presentation, you can have uh, all the question and answers later on. So I'll ask Dr. Amol to introduce our speaker for today. Hello, everyone. Good evening. So myself, Dr. Amol Patel, medical advisor with Caring Fertility India. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Peter Plateau today, who's going to speak on the topic, optimizing the source of LH activity in ART to improve outcomes. So Dr. Peter Plateau is a senior consultant in reproductive medicine from the University of Brussels, Belgium. His educational career spans through esteemed universities <coughs> in different parts of the world, including University of Natal, South Africa, Newcastle University, UK, Monash in Australia and Belgium. Sir has published over 60 articles in peer-reviewed journals and is an author for several international medical books. He is a co and head investigator in different international clinical trials in the field of fertility. Invited as a speaker in over 400 international conferences, has been an organizer of several international workshops in the field of infertility and awarded as the best young clinician by the Fertility Society of Australia at the IVF World Congress, Sydney 1999. So with this, I don't stay as a barrier between this fantastic talk of Dr. Peter Plateau, which is going to be focused on LH activity and how to rationalize LH activity in ART. So we, I hand over to Dr. Peter Plateau, who will first begin this presentation with the polling questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, we'll start first with some, uh, I think there are four questions uh, about the talk, and we'll repeat the questions and after the talk also. It's sort of uh, an evaluation uh, how people think uh, before, and maybe uh, I might change your minds with the talk and we see if that uh, happens afterwards. So the first question is, uh, what according to you is the approximate half-life of uh, LH? Uh, the four options are two minutes, 36 hours, one hour, or three days. I think you can start voting now. Can you yeah, see how yeah, many yeah. have voted? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there is some. You have one minute to vote. Uh, kindly select an option, whichever you think is the best option, and we'll close the survey and move to the next question then. But the people who are voting, they're seeing already the results from the other people. No, they don't see it. No. Okay. We, we are the only ones who see it. Yeah. Okay. And at the end, everybody sees it. Yeah. Okay. Well, once yeah. we say publish. Okay. Yeah. We'll publish everything together. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, it, it's time that we move to the next question. So the next question is, which subgroup of patients, according to you, would benefit from a combination of recombinant FSH plus recombinant LH. So the four options are hyperresponders, normal responders, poor responders, uh, or all of these. So you can start voting. In total, there are now 32 people voting. 33 have already voted. Oh, ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah.
So the next question is, uh, what according to you would be the key reason for better clinical outcomes with menopure as compared to recombinant FSH in all patients' uh, profiles? So the four options are better oocyte quality, better embryo quality, better endometrial receptivity, or all three of them together. These are embryologists over here. <laughs> this is embryology. Well, anyway, this is open for them to go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the last question if you have a hypo hypo patient. Uh, which is stimulated only with recombinant or pure FSH, what can happen? First option is, well, it, nothing will happen. There's no stimulation possible. Uh, after ICSI, you'll have a lot of oocyte degeneration. It will take much longer and a higher dosage will be needed uh, from gonadotropin compared to an HMG uh, or uh, option two and three together. And that's the last question. Sorry? It's, it's, it's working more up. Yeah. 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 You see that. Then we're going to get the. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So uh, we'll end the vote now. Uh, I see a lot of controversy in our answers from different Which locations. So. It will be an interesting session and a lot many things to learn for all of us. So let me end the voting and uh, have the results now. So for the first question, uh, majority have voted for 36 hours, but still some people think less than an hour or three days. Uh, with the second question, we are very much aligned that poor responders, they need some LH, recombinant LH uh, in their system. Uh, with the third question, we have a lot of discrepancies uh, regarding better clinical outcomes with menopure compared to recombinant FSH. Some say it's better oocyte quality, some say all of these are better embryo quality. Let's see during the lecture, mm -hmm. how do we change? And also for the hypo, hypo, uh, if we use only FSH, it, it's a varied answer that you have. Uh, every uh, every option has been collected by a few people. So let's let's go through the presentation and then we can have the poll survey again and maybe the question and answer session that would clear all these things. To us. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll put in there and that's that's that I can do that. Or maybe you have a question there in the box. One more yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, thank you very much for everybody uh, to attending this uh, lecture. For me, it's a little bit uh, uh, different because I'm used to speak uh, in front of a crowd. Uh, here it's uh, a bit different, but no problem at all. Uh, I'm uh, working in uh, Brussels in the university hospital. I will just show you a little slide of uh, Europe. Here you see the whole of Europe. Uh, you put your glasses on and you see this tiny little country here, which is uh, Belgium, and there is a little star there, and that's Brussels, and that's where I work. We do about 5,000 uh, IPF cycles a year, and we started in 91 with the ICSI, and a lot of people came in the meantime to our center in the 90s to learn ICSI. Uh, which is now spread all over uh, the world. I hope everybody is doing ICSI now in an IVF uh, center. Uh, before starting the talk, I just wanted to show you that uh, I was not always working in Brussels, but I also worked in a place uh, not so far from here, well, far from here, from Udaipur, 
uh, in Jamshedpur. Uh, and I know this one center connected, uh, I think, is Ranchi, which is not so far from there. At the time, I went many times to Ranchi. And here you see a picture in front of this hospital where I worked. This is me many, many years ago, uh, when I was still uh, very, very young, uh, together with some uh, colleagues. And at the time, I was working in this hospital uh, in Jamshedpur with this lovely colleague here, Dr. Chawla, uh, who was trained in uh, Birmingham in the UK at the time, and uh, was a lovely lady and a very, very good uh, teacher. Uh, I think now she is retired. Well, that I'm sure that she is retired. Uh, and I think she is living now in uh, Ranchi. Uh, other time in uh, Jamshedpur, that's where I made my first steps in obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, I uh, started in the labor ward there. Uh, and just to uh, tell you a little story from when I started there, uh, the first delivery that I did there was uh, everybody got a, a euphoric after the delivery. Got a bit surprised. Well, what's happening here? And the midwife said, "Well, uh, larka he." I said, "Okay, fine." Uh, the second delivery again, larka he. Third delivery, larka he. And by a coincidence, the first seven deliveries, seventeen deliveries that I did there were always larka he. And the word of mouth went through the hospital. It was a, a missionary hospital for very poor, poor people. And Larkahe was very, very important for these people, uh, I think at the time and maybe still now. Uh, but the word of mouth went that uh, this new white doctor from uh, Europe, if, you, if he did the delivery, then it was for sure going to be a boy. And patients were asking me to do the deliveries because they were hoping that they were getting a boy. Of course, number 18, 19, 20 was Larkahe. You know, statistics is like that. But it didn't matter anymore. Uh, I had my name, I had my fame. If I did the delivery, uh, it was a boy, for sure. Just a little story from when I worked there in uh, Jamshedpur. Now, in my private life, things were a little bit different. Here you see my three daughters. Uh, some years ago, they are uh, a bit older now. Uh, the one in the middle now, uh, on this day, uh, was born 16 years ago. Uh, it's her birthday now. Uh, but uh, when my wife delivered, it was always Larki. And I thought for the last one, uh, knowing my fame from Jamshedpur, I decided, well, uh, I will do the delivery myself. Although in Belgium, medically, legally, and ethically, uh, people are uh, asked not to do this. You never know if something happens and you will take this for your whole life if, if something goes wrong, etc., etc. But anyway, I thought, you know, the third time I will do it myself. I know from Jamshedpur, uh, I did the delivery. It was a very easy delivery. My wife delivers very easily. And uh, there was my third daughter. Again, it was Larki. But oh, we are very happy with my three daughters. Uh, and the last one, uh, Luna, and you see with the blue eyes and the blonde hair. I wanted to uh, introduce this talk with a story about her. Uh, she, in the beginning of her life, when she was two, three years old, when you see her there, she had a lot of uh, throat infections. She had a lot of tonsillitis. Uh, she was sick, fever. She needed to take uh, antibiotics. And uh, at a certain moment, uh, my wife decided to look, you know, it's better to get a specialist opinion about her. And she took uh, her to the ENT specialist. And I'll show you a little picture of the throat of my uh, youngest daughter. And as you can see, I'm not an ENT specialist, but as you can see, you don't have to be an ENT specialist. These beautiful swollen tonsils of Luna, and they got infected very, very easily. And they got, you always got these white spots on them. Uh, so she went to the ENT specialist. And uh, this guy said, look, you know, uh, it should be OK. It's not so bad. But maybe you should consider uh, an operation and taking these swollen tonsils away. And Luna will be uh, much better afterwards. So she came home, because I, I didn't come go with her to the specialist. 
uh, with the story. Uh, she was very emotional about her, uh, you know, a child getting an operation, general anesthetic. We are both doctors, you know how this goes. You know also that things sometimes go a bit wrong. Uh, so I believe in evidence-based medicine. So I thought, uh, well, let's go to the literature and see if uh, it goes better for these children after a tonsillectomy or if it doesn't matter at all. Uh, I went through all the papers and I can say you, I didn't find any randomized control trial where they compared either a group with patients who had the tonsillectomy and another group who didn't do the tonsillectomy, they just had, you know, antibiotics and then we see further. It didn't happen. I found one interesting paper from uh, an epidemiologist, uh, a Scandinavian epidemiologist, which was published in The Lancet a long, long time ago. Uh, it was in the 50s, and I suspect this guy had the same problem. Probably one of his children got a lot of uh, throat infections, and uh, he did a very, very interesting study. And the study was that he took 200 children from a certain school, all the age of Luna, put them on a bus, and went to an ENT specialist. So the ENT specialist looked at these children, looked at the throat, examined them, and after the examination, it meant that 140 of these children were okay, and 60 needed tonsillectomy. And now the story becomes interesting. What did he do, the uh, epidemiologist? Well, he took these 140 children who were remaining, who didn't need tonsillectomy, he took them to another ENT specialist, with them on the bus, went there, they were examined, and then this ANT specialist said, well, you know, 100, no problem at all, you can leave them like that, 40 of them need tonsillectomy. And then he did it another time, these 100 who were remaining, again on the bus, again to a different ENT specialist, and from these 100, there were again 20 who needed tonsillectomy, and then he stopped his research, and he wrote the paper. And the conclusions of the paper, I think, were quite easy, there are no real indications for tonsillectomy. There's no evidence-based medicine to do this. So I think this child didn't get uh, any tonsillectomy. Needless to say that Luna didn't get any tonsillectomy and she still has these beautiful thick tonsils. She's now 12 years old. She's a very healthy child and I'm very happy about the decision just to leave it like it is. But this shows evidence-based medicine in ENT. Now we are fertility specialists, and I just showed this example of my daughter. What we are doing in IVF, in the fertility world, that we are doing a lot of unnecessary things, things that are not evidence-based. We do it because we heard about it, because some doctor talked about it, we talked hard about it, and then we think, yeah, this is good, we should do that. But there are no evidence to show that it is yes or no. Just to talk about your face, for example, what do we give after the transfer? Well, when you look at Dr. Google of Internet, you find a list of drugs that you can give in, uh, in the luteal phase. None of them, apart from the progesterone, who are proven that they are going to give a benefit for the pregnancy. I talk about heparin, aspirin, cortisone, uh, whatever drugs that are there, you can give it to your patients. Uh, they can fill up the stomach of your patients. They uh, not, will not be hungry anymore. Uh, it can go. And we are plotted by these things in reproductive medicine in IVF. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about LH. And first, the basics, the physiology of LH, uh, what's happening in a normal natural cycle. And here you see the line of LH. It looks like a steady line during the uh, first phase of the cycle. And then you have this peak of LH with the ovulation, and then again, a line, steady state line. So it looks like a normal line that you always have the same things, but this is not true. What's happening, this line, in fact, is a pulsative, a pulsative line from the hypothalamus. Here you can see that according to which phase of the, of the cycle you are, you have these pulses every 90 to 100 to 200 minutes of LH. 
And why does Mother Nature does this? Well, it's very, very simple. The half-life of LH is so short that you have to give this process all the time because otherwise it becomes a disaster. Just one pulse and then nothing anymore. Well, the half-life of LH is about 10 minutes, half an hour, maybe one hour. If you give one pulse, then the rest of the, of the 24 hours, the patient will not get any LH and this, the cycle will just stop. So this is how Mother Nature compensated or sorted this short half-life out from, uh, for our patients or uh, all women. Now, is this true? What's happening uh, with the, the half-life of LH compared to a ACG? Well, I want to show you this slide. Uh, and this slide shows here LH. This is ACG. And what's the difference between ACG and LH? The only difference is this part, which is the carboterminal peptide, which is, gives the half-life, the stability to ACG. So in fact, ACG is exactly the same as LH plus this one. And you could say that ACG is a long-acting LH. It's just the same, but it's just long-acting. So what did some clever people do some time ago? Well, they took some scissors, they cut this CTP, this carboxy terminal peptide, away, and then they took FSH, they put some glue at the, at the end of the FSH, and they put this carboxy terminal peptide here at the end, and the result was FSH CTP, a long acting FSH. And this now is on the market in Europe. I think in India it's not on the market, but it's called a LONVA. It's a long acting FSH. And the FSH half life is normally one day. You give one daily injection. When you give this one, you have enough for seven days. So it's only one injection for the whole period of seven days. So the same principle as with LH and, FS and, uh, and ACG, LH, short-acting LH, long-acting uh, LH, here, short-acting FSH, long-acting FSH. And it's thanks to this CTP, carboxy terminal peptide, that you get from a half-life of 10 minutes in LH to a half-life of nearly two days. So is this true, what I'm saying? Well, I want to show you a few slides about the proof of this. And this is a study, it's a very, very old study. It's a Dutch study where they believed at the time that there was no need of mutual support if you used an antagonist protocol, which is a bit strange, but that was their belief. And they used three groups of patients with an antagonist protocol, IVF. One group was triggered with ACG. Another group was triggered with recombinant LH, not the one that you have here on the market, a very, very small ampoule, but a big, big dosage. It costed about 10,000 euros only to give one injection. And then the other group was given an agonist, like an agonist trigger that we all know that we use uh, a lot. So the difference was ACG, recombinant LH, or the natural LH triggered by an agonist. And as you can see, the pregnancy rates uh, here, they are 18%, uh, 8%, 13%. In my eyes, very, very poor. Why was it very poor? Because these patients didn't get any luteal support. I think after this article, it became quite clear that also in an agon antagonist uh, cycle, you need luteal support. Otherwise, your pregnancy rates are going to be very, very poor. But I showed this uh, slide mainly because of this. They looked at what, how many days the progesterone remained very high and then started going down. And you see that when you give ACG, it took eight days and then it went down. If you give recombinant LH or the natural LH from an agonist, it's after four days already. So a double longer if you give ACG because of this much longer half life. Another proof of concept is a study that we did uh, in our unit some years ago with uh, uh, Christophe Bloquet. And what did we do? Well, to show you the protocol here, 
We started uh, on day two, this is an antagonist protocol, with 200 units of uh, recombinant FSH, two groups, the, the, the control group and the study group. We were giving 200 units every day. On day six, and that's what's our usual protocol in the unit, that we start always with a fixed uh, antagonist protocol. So on the six, we started with, uh, I think it was Organitram on both sides. And here we continued with the daily dose, uh, dosages of uh, injections of uh, 200 units of recombinant FSH. In the study group, we stopped the FSH completely and we replaced it with 200 units of low dose ACG every day. So no FSH at all. What were the results? Well, the results were here. Then you see live birth rates in the control group. 42%, 65% in the low dose ACG. This is not significant because the numbers were very small, but you can see that if you replace ACG, um, FSH with ACG, it doesn't affect your pregnancy rate at all. There was a clear, in the contrary, that there is a clear uh, tendency to have even a better pregnancy rate if you just continue with ACG 200 units every day. So that works very, very well. I show you this uh, example because I know that some people tried, yes, tried to do the same thing with, uh, instead of ACG, with recombinant LH, with berries, because it's also LH. And if you do that, and I invite you, but I invite you to do it just to see it, I think you shouldn't do it because after one or two injections here, you see that everything is dropping down. The follicles, follicles are collapsing, so dial is collapsing because the short half-life, it does not work. It doesn't have the CTP, it doesn't have this half-life, so it doesn't work uh, at all. So what about uh, the studies that we have between recombinant FSH and recombinant FSH combined with recombinant LH? So in fact, the question is, what does this recombinant LH add to as benefit to the patient? Well, there is a big meta-analysis published some years ago where you see that the pregnancy rate, if you add recombinant LH, yes or no, it doesn't change at all. It remains the same. Now, this meta-analysis was uh, uh, divided in agonist protocols and antagonist protocols. And you see here in an antagonist protocol, it does not work, it does not matter. Maybe, as you can see here, in a long protocol, an agonist protocol, maybe in the subgroup of two responders, it might have an effect, but not in the antagonist protocol. So uh, it was decided to do a big study in two responders on the basis of this meta-analysis uh, in a long protocol to show that maybe this recombinant NH has an effect in this group, uh, yes or no. And that was the SPART study, which was done some years ago, was just published uh, a year ago. And how was a beautiful, beautiful study, uh, more than 1,000 patients in poor uh, responders. Not easy to do a study like that in poor responders. The biggest study ever published in poor responders. All patients, according to the Bologna criteria, uh, were recruited. And then the, was, they were either, it was a long protocol, which in my book, a long protocol for poor responders might be not the ideal uh, protocol, but uh, that's uh, another discussion. And so the patients started with uh, down regulation with Vitorolin. Then once uh, down regulation was uh, done, they either went, uh, were recruited to one of the two groups, either where they were get, getting uh, recombinant FSH together with uh, uh, recombinant LH, 300 units of recombinant LH uh, and uh, uh, FSH and LH or just recombinant FSH as a control group. So they went through the whole simulation, as you know very well, triggered, pick up, transfer, and then luteal support. What were the results? Well, the results were really disappointing uh, for the recombinant LH, because uh, in the control group, the number of all sites was 3.6, 3.3, not significant, so no difference at all in the number of all sites. 
What about the pregnancy rates? At the end of the day, that's the most important bit. And as you can see, the live birth rate, 10.6, 11.7 in the control group, no differences at all. So that's a bit of a, a, a bugger for a big study that costed a lot of money. Uh, so, you know, when you publish a, a study like that, you also have to go and see how you can uh, sell this. Uh, you invested a lot of money uh, and you cannot say that, you know, there was a wasted study. Uh, there is no difference at all. So uh, just drop the recombinant LH because uh, it doesn't make any difference. Now, what people do is, uh, is they do the massage of the data. And here you see a picture of a deep tissue massage, which you can have in every hotel, in every uh, spa. You can ask for that. Now, the question is, uh, how deep can you go with the deep tissue massage? Here, clearly, the guy went a bit too deep and with all the problems. They did a bit the same in this study. Uh, they did a very deep tissue massage of all the data. And at the end, they came out that there might be a subgroup that still might benefit from this recombinant LH. So the conclusion of the study was, well, there was no difference in live birth rate. But if you look for a, another subgroup, and then something very, very, very new, they decided, well, you know, the two responders, they're not all the same. You have normal poor responders, you have moderate poor responders, you have severe poor responders. And it seems that the recombinant LH, when you put all these statistics again and reanalyze these data and massage them very, very deeply, that there might be a subgroup of patients, but they have to be severely poor responders, they have to be old also, and you have to use a long protocol with an agonist. There might be an indication for these patients to use recombinant LH, but more studies to have to confirm this. Result is it does not work. Why doesn't it work? Because the half life is so short. So, where is the benefit of menopause? Well, I'll just go straight to this slide. When you look at the meta analysis of uh, menopause, and live birth rate, you see very clearly that if you use the normal responders, the menopil, the HMG, compared to recombinant uh, FSH, the live birth rate at the end is higher in favor of uh, HMG, in favor of menopil. This is about 3-4% more. Well, it's not massive. But okay, uh, it's uh, the extra 3-4% 3, 4 3 4 patients on 100. It's always that. Now, why is this? And this is a slide that I like to use when I'm doing monitoring of patients, when I'm stimulating patients. It's a very simplified slide, so that makes it also easy to use all the time. And it combines the two hormones, LH, FSH, and the two cells, the Tika cells and the granulosa cells in the ovary, in the follicles. So now, What's happening when we stimulate? Well, we have to give the injections with FSH, although otherwise you don't get any follicles. You get one follicle and that's it, but you don't, you don't want to have many follicles. So we give an FSH, 150 units, 225, 300, whatever, according to what we think is best for the patient, and these follicles are starting to grow on the granulosa side. What we do not realize is that at the same time, by giving this FSH, we convert cholesterol into progesterone. And this progesterone on this side cannot be converted because this enzyme is missing and it goes into the bloodstream. And what does it do further? Well, it goes into the bloodstream, it goes to the endometrium and it affects the endometrium. And what we see when we have, we have high dosages of progesterone, it makes the endometrium go from proliferative phase into secretory phase. So we change our implantation window which is not good for our pregnancy. On the other side, we also have, under the influence of LH, the conversion of cholesterol into progesterone. But there, under the influence of LH, LH activity, ACG, we get a conversion of these progesterones into androgens, which then convert to go to the other side, where they are aromatized in these 
So if you give a gonadotropin which contains long-acting LH, ACG, you will have higher androgens at the end, higher estrogens at the end, but more importantly, you get lower adjustments. And that's why I think this is the benefit of menopause because it contains this ACG. So what does it say for, for example, poor responder stimulation? Poor responders, they have very few granulosa cells because they have very few follicles. Yeah, maybe two, three follicles. And what do we do? And what do we tend to do, which I think is not right? We tend to increase this FSH to very high levels. We stimulate with 300 units. We stimulate with 450 units. I even heard 600 units. But what do we do? We convert a lot of cholesterol into progesterone and we affect the endometrium. What do we don't do is we do not create follicles. If, the three, if there are three follicles there, the higher the dose, these follicles are going to grow, but they're not going to create other follicles. You will just stimulate what you have there, nothing else. So it's my opinion that we should not stimulate very hard. Here. It's more expensive also. I think in a normal size poor responder, 150 units will be more than enough to make these two, three follicles grow and get these other cells. No need to go to higher doses. In the contrary, I think it's even better, it's cheaper, but also here you will not have these problems with progesterone. And I am afraid that a lot of times we stimulate them very hard, we get these three follicles, but we have also very high progesterone levels. We have an endometrium which is not ready anymore for the uh, implantation. We still do the transfer and the patient is not pregnant. Why? Because she's a poor responder. We always have bad results for poor responder, but maybe also because we did bad things to the endometrium because we stimulated much too hard. That's one example. Another example of patients which are very, very sensitive to these things are the hyper responders. And these patients are usually forgotten a little bit. They have a lot of granulosa cells. So they are very much at risk of this conversion to progesterone. So a little, little bit of FSH and already this progesterone will go up the hyper responders. And I want to show you a study here that was published some uh, years ago. Here you see clearly a hyper responder. And here you see uh, the slide of this study. And the initial uh, study was to look at these are patients from the merit study. That's a study, a randomized study, long uh, protocol where we compared menopause with recombinant FSH, mega set, the same, but in an antagonist uh, protocol, and then the two together. They only took patients who had an FSH, uh, uh, sorry, an AMH, but more than 5.2. So really high responders, close to PCO patients. Even. And they saw that although the Number the, the, the stimulation was the same. Here it was 225 units on both sides. Here it was 150 on both sides. Although the, the, the stimulation was the same, the risks of having more than 15 oocytes retrieved at the end of the stimulation, and 15 oocytes for us means, you know, risk of hyperstimulation, alarm bells going on because this patient is at risk of, of hyperstimulation. The chances of having this was much higher if you used recombinant FSH. Okay, that's fine, that's nice to, to hear about, but much to the surprise is the pregnancy rates. So although these patients who received menopause had much less oocytes, significantly less oocytes, the live birth rate was here 13% higher, 11% higher, and if you take them all together, 12% higher. <clears throat> Remember this meta-analysis that I showed you before, where there was three, four percent difference in normal responders, here we're talking about double figures, more than 10 percent difference in the hyper responders, and that's a lot. And why is that? Well, most probably in these patients, these 12 percent here, the difference here, these patients had a high progesterone level, the endometrium was already in the secondary phase, implantation window was gone. And although the embryos were very, very beautiful, they were put back at a, at a time which was not appropriate anymore, which explains the difference. So a big difference, a big impact on the endometrium. 
Now, <clears throat> if we talk about the history of suppression, we started in the 80s and we didn't have any suppression at all. So it was keep fingers crossed. Hopefully the patient didn't ovulate. There was no LH surge and we could do a pickup at the control time. If not, if there wasn't a late search, even at three o'clock at the night, you have to do and do, go and do the pickup. Now, luckily, 80s, 90s, we get the agonists, and the agonists prevent this, they prevent the LH search, and they start suppressing the endogenous LH. But with the agonist, every time you give an agonist, you get a little uh, search also in the pituitary gland, with some LH coming free, and the suppression is not too bad getting nicely away with it. Suppression, not too bad. Then they came with the antagonists, and the antagonists, they're not having this flare up, but they are competitive inhibitors of the, in the pituitary gland. And there, the LH is already much more suppressed. He's still getting away with it, although I think there's a subgroup of patients that we do not realize they're not getting away with it, and they really have very low LH levels. And I think in the future, we're getting to really zero LH levels. And I'm going to come to that later, because I think the future is suppression, not anymore with antagonist and agonist, but just with progesterone. Why progesterone? Because it's the cheap. In Belgium, an antagonist costs 50 euros every shot. This costs close, close to nothing anymore. But I come to that later. First, one little uh, thing. There was one question about this. This is a study in a hypo hypo. <clears throat> and I show you this study just to show you the impact that it has on a hypo hypo woman. This is a Spanish woman, and they did a long protocol. Hypo hypo so it means she does not, not have any LH, no FSH. The first time she did IVF, she did she got only FSH, pure FSH. The second time they used an HMG. The third time they used pure FSH with isodial valiolate. And here you see clearly what's the difference in the hypo hypo uh, when you give an HMG which contains ACG and FSH only. So, what do you see? That if you give FSH only, the stimulation takes longer and you need much more ampules to stimulate. But more importantly, well, of course, uh, isodial is very, very low. There's no LH, there's no reduction of isodial much less oocytes, there were seven oocytes, the doses was the same, and here there were 14. And the fertilization rate was very, very poor compared to very nice. Why is this very poor? Because after ICSI, a lot of these oocytes degenerated because these oocytes never saw LH, and it seems that it makes them very, very weak and very much prone to degeneration after ICSI. And this is a patient which does not see any LH at all. So it works the stimulation, but the results are disastrous. I want to show you in the same context a case report that we had some years ago in the university and which is quite interesting. It's a patient, Belgian patient, 35 years old. She has a, a genetic uh, problem. It's Branchioborino syndrome. Never heard about it before, but well. It's a severe problem. She herself is affected, and for that she had a renal transplant. She had already uh, a child which died because of the problem, and now she's on the, on the contraceptive pill. She doesn't want to be pregnant anymore, and she came to see us because she wanted to avoid having uh, more affected children uh, and to do a PGD cycle. Here are her uh, standard uh, uh, preliminary results. So you see AMH very nice very high, so a good patient for stimulation. So what do we do normally in our unit for uh, PGD patients? Well, we stimulate them, uh, we do a pickup, we do the ICSI, we leave the embryos in culture till day five, then we do a blastocyst biopsy, we freeze all the embryos, and then a few weeks later we get the results of the genetic analysis. And then we can see we replace only the embryos which are genetically normal and the other embryos are disregarded. So in patients like that, it's a freeze all, we're not interested in the endometrium at all. So the protocol that we use, this is the software from our units that we use it. It's a little bit difficult to see, 
But if you, I can just go you around it. Here we did an antagonist protocol because ID was antagonist protocol, then trigger with uh, an agonist, and then uh, freeze all. Patient stopped with the pill, did the first uh, blood sample here in the beginning of the cycle. LH was uh, non existent, 0, 1. The sodium progesterone was very low, and we started with 150 units of uh, recombinant at the stage. Standard as we do fixed protocol, where we after six days or after five days, rather, we added Zetsotide, we continued with 150. We did the first blood test, sodium still low, uh, progesterone was uh, uh, 0. Point something, uh, LH01. We continued the stimulation, another blood test. So dial went up a little bit, progesterone was one point something, but of course no problem at all with doing a, uh, no fresh cycle. Another blood test at the end, progesterone was three point something, uh, is the dial 800, uh, LH 0 0.1, and we did the, we decided for uh, pickup there. Here are the results of the, the ultrasound. As you can see, the doctor with the ultrasound wrote down risk of OHSS, and you can see this all these follicles here, so really at risk, but it's good for PGD, uh, and anyway, there's no risk if you're going to trigger with uh, an agonist. A bit strange, because this dial was low, 800 units, with all these uh, follicles. So we triggered with an agonist, and then 36 hours later, we did uh, the pickup. Uh, pickups uh, are done in our units under local anesthesia, and the doctor who did the pickup started with the left ovary, and after taking all the follicles, and there are plenty of follicles there in the left ovary taken away, uh, the number of oocytes was zero, nothing. So then crisis. Uh, the th thanks to the local anesthetic, it's easy for us to go and discuss with the patient. And we asked, of course, you know, the first thing that we think about is, is this patient made a mistake with her injections of the agonist? This patient, however, is a clever patient. She had already a renal transplant. She's been in and out of the hospital a hundred times. She knows how it works. Uh, we checked everything. Patient did it rightly on the right moment, 36 hours before, no problem at all. So then the doctor started calling around. You know, the senior doctors who are upstairs, who are doing the research, what should we do? And a, an urgent meeting was taken. It had to go very, very quickly because in the meantime, this patient is waiting there in the stirrups for the pickup. And it was decided that we would stop the pickup, give her 5,000 of ACG, and then repeat the pickup 36 hours later, maybe better by a senior doctor. Because you never know, you know, the doctor who did it there, maybe she's a bit junior and she doesn't know how to do pickups and things like that. So that was done. And I'll show you then when we did the pickup the second time. And this senior doctor this time did a pickup. And there was 18 oocytes retrieved. I think 13 were mature. Seven were uh, fertilized. We had six embryos on dates five for biopsies. And three of them were genetically normal. And that we could freeze and then transfer in another time. So big, big uh, surprise. How come that now we have all sites which we didn't have the last time? Well, it may be, and I think it's very clear. First time it was a junior doctor who did the pickup. Second time it was a senior doctor who did the pickup. And of course, senior doctors have more experience, and that's how they get to the 18 all sites. Well, there is another problem going on there. And what happened here is a problem uh, that we didn't understand, and that we are going to look into the literature to find an explanation. Is there anybody who had the same problem before? And needless to say also, with this patient, two, three days later, she was admitted to the ICU because of severe hyperstimulation, because of this 5,000 of ACG. Luckily, everything went fine. She recovered and then could have, in a natural cycle later on, the transfer and was a happy ending. She had a healthy child. But what happened? So in the literature, we couldn't find anything except one study, an American New York study, that seemed to have this same problem. And they realized it earlier than us, and they published it. And what did they say is, 
they looked at all the patients who had an agonist trigger uh, and how was the outcome. We triggered a lot, they also. And they realized that a lot of these patients had what they call suboptimal response to the trigger. Suboptimal response, what does it mean? You have 20 follicles there, you do the pickup, and you only have five, six, seven four sites, which is not normal. 27, something is wrong. From 20, you should have 15 at least four sites to get out. Otherwise, either the patient didn't do it right to the agonist, or the guy who does the pickup doesn't know what he's doing, or there's something else going on. And I think that's what's happening. And what they realized is that there was a clear correlation with the, the risk of having the suboptimal response and LH levels at the end of the stimulation when you trigger. If you had a non-existent LH level, there was a 25% chance that these patients had a suboptimal response. Now, our patients, our case report that I showed you there, is really at the end of the range. It's not a suboptimal response. It's just zero. There were no oversight coming. And then these people also looked what kind of patients are at risk of this. And then they found out that this, all of these patients had very low LH levels at the, at the end of the stimulation, also during the stimulation, like our patient, it was non existent. And a lot of these patients were oocyte donors who were on the contraceptive pill before, like our patients. So, what happened here? Well, it's something similar as the post pill amenorrhea. You know all these patients that take the pill for a long, long time, they stop the pill, they have a bleeding, and then for six months they do not bleed at all, they don't have cycles anymore. What happens is there is a problem from the hypothalamic level that there is no uh, stimulation to the pituitary gland, and there are few or no LH receptors on the pituitary gland. So what happened in our patients, and most probably in these patients also, because of these long time low LH levels or even non existent LH levels, the LH receptors on the pituitary gland were either very, very small or non existent. You give this decapeptil or this triptorelin or agonist trigger, what does it do? It goes to the pituitary gland, it goes on the receptor of LH. Of course, if there's no receptors there, you cannot get the LHP and nothing is happening. And when you do the pickup, there's no oocytes coming. Maybe there are a few uh, LH receptors, like in this study. And what happens then? Well, with a few LH receptors, you have a small LH peak, and it will mature a few follicles, a few oocytes in these follicles. And instead of having 20 follicles and 15 or 17 oocytes, we have 20 follicles and three, four, five oocytes. Because this LH peak, because there was very small LH receptors, was too small. To trigger the whole thing. What we, what we do in our case, in 36 hours later, we trigger with ACG. ACG has nothing to do with the pituitary glands, but it goes straight to the ovary and it matures the follicles straight to the ovary. So no need of these LH receptors in the pituitary glands, and then we have 18 oocytes. And that was probably what's happening here in our cases. And there we realized that when we trigger, we stimulate, and we trigger with an agonist, we have a problem in certain patients which have very low LH levels. And I think we should be aware of this, because I think we're playing with fire that now these days patients are having very, very low LH levels. So what's the future of the stimulation? And especially in suppression, and I mentioned it already. First of all, we freeze all embryos now because the vitrification uh, techniques are excellent. We have 99% survival, no problem. We trigger with an agonist to avoid hyperstimulation. And what I think the next future is we leave the agonist, the antagonist, because they're getting expensive, and we can use progesterone. And this progesterone is coming from China. Just want to show you one study from them. And here you see it, it's a retrospective study. What happened here in this study? They use with progesterone, whatever progesterone, from the beginning of the cycle, every evening, one uh, vaginal tablet. This was orally taken. Uh, and in an antagonist protocol, they start with an HMG 150 to 25, according to what the patient is in front of you. The control group was a flare up. 
with the same uh, dosage of HMG, and the patients were triggered either with the field or with an agonist or with ACG. Of course, then all embryos were frozen, especially because we're getting this uh, progesterone, so the progesterone in the lithium is not good. And here you see the results, the number of ampules used compared to the two, especially the number of oocytes that we took, it's about 10 in both groups, so it works very, very well. Cancellation rate is exactly the same. And even the pregnancy rates then after frozen transfer, 43%, 35%, I don't think it's significant, but it sees that it works very, very well, this uh, protocol. And it's the cheap, progesterone doesn't cost anything. But this progesterone, how does it work? It doesn't work on the pituitary gland, it works a little bit, but it mainly works directly on the hypothalamus. It switches off everything there. So there is no LH coming from the hepatic. Well, there's no activation of the LH from the hypothalamus, and the receptors in the pituitary gland are getting too close to zero. So we have to be careful there. So what happened first? What did they do first in this protocol? Because it works very well. On day two, they start with the progesterone, and you have to start on day two. If you start too late, like for example, with an, uh, an antagonist protocol, then if the estradiol is already high, you're going to induce uh, the ovulation and you're going to be in trouble. So you have to start from the beginning, and on day two, you also start with FSH. Then after the stimulation, you trigger with an agonist, and then you do this. That was the initial protocol, and the results were very, very bad. Why were they very, very bad? Because this combination of the progesterone and FSH without LH and the agonist showed, as I showed already before, very low LH levels and suboptimal responses or even no response at all. They adapted this protocol completely and everything was put into work to get these LH levels up. Chromifrane citrate, as we know, makes the LH levels go up. HMG, which contains long-acting LH, and then at the end, an agonist trigger, but combined with ACG. And that's what we give now always, when we trigger with an agonist, we give also an ACG at the same time. For patients, normally we give 1,000 units of ACG. The patient is really, really at risk, we give 500 units of ACG with good results. Just shows over the time, with this problem of LH, how this protocol was adopted uh, and now it's good results. So the final conclusions is, well, this recombinant LH, very nice, but it has a very, very short half-life. And if you want it to work, I think you have to give up to six injections every day to get it going, because otherwise the half-life is much too short. Very expensive. FDA not approved because there's never been any study that shows the efficacy. In Europe, it's a little bit uh, different. AMA approved it since 10 years. And the funny thing, when you look at Europe, and I showed you also already the map here, that when you put a line here through Europe, South Europe, North Europe, here a lot of this recombinant LH is being used. In the north of Europe, nearly nothing is used. That's very strange. The reason for that, I would not say in public, maybe we say afterwards, but I can only uh, conclude that it might be to do with the climate. Here in the south of Europe, it's very warm and it seems to work. Here it's too cold and it seems not to work at all. But I think there might be other explanations for that, which I cannot say now in public. So I thank you, all of you. This is a group's photo from our unit in Brussels. Uh, as you can see, uh, Professor van Stettingen here, who is now getting very old and has a long beard. Professor De Bruyne is still in good form. All the fellows, all the embryologists there. My wife, who just delivered the last baby here. And where am I? Well, I was not there for the good uh, picture because I was away in another country giving some lectures. Thank you very much. Any questions uh, there? I don't know how the techniques go. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peter uh, Plateau, for the excellent lecture. Now I would open the session for some question and answers. <clears throat> so you would see a chat box uh, in your place. Uh, you can start putting in questions there. And uh, 
Dr. Peter would be more than happy to respond to your question. You can go also to the this one the other people it was also there. Yeah. Then the people okay. have gone to uh, okay. make it. If you're having some problems, uh, yeah, okay. So we have the first question. Is it uh, on the right bottom. Uh, reason for adding clomiphene citrate in your protocol. Okay, well that's the last protocol, the progesterone protocol. The reason for giving this uh, clomiphene is that when the standard protocol was used only with recombinant FSH uh, and trigger with an, an agonist and nothing else. They realized there were big problems because of low LH levels, like I showed in our case report. Uh, everything was done to this protocol to get these LH levels up to improve the, the results. And one of the things that can put uh, LH levels up is using chromophene. We know that chromophene makes LH levels go very, very high. That's why uh, chromophene was introduced in this protocol. It uh, affects the endometrium, but in this protocol with progesterone, there is no fresh transfer anyway. So we don't care about endometrium if it's thin, yes or no, due to the chromophane, it doesn't matter. Next. When do you recommend FSH or LH receptor polymorphism test to be done in previous poor response or empty follicle syndrome? Uh -huh. That's a difficult one. Uh, for sure, not routinely, because it's a very expensive uh, test. Uh, I think you might do it if you have the opportunity and you can do it in patients uh, with this optimal response and you don't have any explanation. The LH is very good, uh, so that's not the explanation that I have a suboptimal uh, response. Uh, means you stimulate uh, and uh, the follicles are not growing, uh, although you see many small follicles, on top follicle count is normal. There might be a problem in the receptor there. Empty follicle syndrome is, is a, a different uh, story. Uh, empty follicle syndrome it doesn't happen first so often. Secondly, a lot of these empty follicle syndromes are explained because of mistakes from the patient. Uh, and you know, they didn't do the injection well at the end, too late, too early, whatever, or not, no injection at all. Some of them you see with very few follicles, so if you only have two follicles, it might happen that you don't get the oocytes, nothing to do with empty follicle, it's just, you know, statistics, you don't have them. And then you have these few patients that really have empty follicle, you stimulate them, everything is done according to the book, and you don't get any oocytes. Uh, and I'm afraid there, uh, yes, you can do this test, uh, and then you have an explanation. I think a lot of times, you have no explanation at all, and the uh, end uh, story is usually oocyte donation, and that's it. Next question is, uh, live birth rates better in HMG compared to FSH only? Does it apply for the frozen embryo transfer cycles and donor cycles as well? Yeah, very good question. Uh, from the merit study, we know that um, when you compare the HMG menopause with the competent FSH, Although in the live birth rate, fresh cycle was better in the HMG. Everywhere, every meta-analysis, it always comes to the same. And this most probably because there's endometrium impact from the progesterone. In frozen cycles, what we saw in the merit study is that the number, although there were more oocytes in the recombinant FSH, at the end of the day, the number of embryos frozen was exactly the same. So these extra embryos you get from the recombinant FSH are not good oocytes. You know, they're the rubbish oocytes that you get extra, but at the end of the day, you cannot do much for it, and it doesn't result in higher number of embryos frozen. When then we went further in this study and we looked at the frozen embryos, the towing, the survival, was exactly the same in the two uh, groups, and the pregnancy rates was exactly the same also. Another uh, proof to show that it's in the fresh cycle, this progesterone that makes a difference, in frozen cycles, there is no progesterone there, it is a natural cycle, it doesn't make a difference at all. So there, no differences at all, no. Next question is, can we use medroxyprogesterone instead of eutrogesterone? Of course, and we 
started using medroxyprogesterone uh, first. And the reason for that for MPA is that, uh, well, the advantage for that is that if you want to use this protocol with progesterone and you want to follow the progesterone to see if does it work, does it suppress? Well, you can take blood for progesterone. If you use MPA, the MPA doesn't increase your, you cannot measure the progesterone from MPA in your blood. So the progesterone with MPA will be still very, very low. If it goes up, it means you have an endogenous surge of LH and an endogenous production of progesterone. So in this way, MPA might even be more advantage. Yeah. Next question is, should we start HMG from beginning or in the later half of the cycle? Well, I believe you should do it in, in the beginning. Why? Uh, and I understand this very, very well. You have these cocktail protocols that people, the philosophy is in the beginning of the stimulation, you have very, very small follicles. There are no LH receptors at all on these follicles. So why would you give an HMG? It's not going to do anything. There is no LH receptors. You know, it's not going to have a, a, an effect at all. It's only after four or five days when these uh, follicles are growing that you have LH receptors and there you get the benefit uh, of HMG. Why, would, why do we start first from the beginning? One, because it's much more simple. And I like it simple for the patients because patients, you know, for them, this is very, very strange. They're not used to give injections, they're not used to play with these drugs. So I'd, I'd rather give it simple. But then there's another reason for it. For example, we know from studies where we compared long-acting FSH with the daily dosages of FSH, the long run. And we saw that if you give daily dosages of FSH, it takes five days before you have a steady state of your FSH levels. The same is within HMG. If you want to benefit from this ACG in the HMG, it takes about five days before you have a steady state level of ACG and LH uh, that is steady state. If you start on day six and you trigger on day nine, you're never going to get this, uh, reach this steady state level. So you're going to be too late. And that's another reason why I prefer to start from the beginning. Next question, if a follicles on day two seem synchronous, but we see an asynchronous response upon starting HMG menopure, what do you suggest should be done? Does increasing the dose help? Not really. Uh, and I, I, I think it's talking about antagonist protocols yeah. here. In antagonist protocols, and this is uh, something different, Antagonist protocols are very easy, they're very good, very patient friendly, and the, the big, big advantage is that we can trigger with an agonist and we get away with hyperstimulation and all these problems. The problem with an, an antagonist protocol is that we standard start on day two of the cycle. So the patient the first day says, I have my cycle, the second day you start with FSH. What happens on day two of the cycle? We have follicles which are 9, 10, 11 millimeter thick, and then you have a, a wave of follicles who are 4, 5, 6 millimeter uh, thick. And then you start stimulating, and you have these two waves of follicles that are growing. The big wave, the, the first wave, the, the 9, 10, 11 ones, and then the second wave, the 5, 6, 7 millimeter ones that are starting growing. So you have this asynchronous uh, stimulation of the follicles. And that's typical for an antagonist protocol. That's also why in antagonist you get less oocytes compared to a long protocol. In the long protocol, you have this more synchronous uh, stimulation. How can you get away with it? What we do, personal in our practice, is that instead of starting day two of the stimulation with, a, with, with the cycle, we start with the stimulation, we start with an antagonist. So day two, three, four, we give an antagonist, sort like a long protocol, but in an antagonist protocol that works much quicker. And what does happen in this day two, three, four, where we give the antagonist even sometimes longer, you have these two waves of follicles that are coming close together. And then if on day five, everything is ready, you start a stimulation and you have one big wave, all follicles together to get a more synchronized uh, stimulation, resulting in many more all sides than if you start immediately on day two. Uh, and that's how we get around these uh, problems with this unsynchronized uh, stimulation. We start with an antagonist in three days, usually three days, and then only we start uh, with the stimulation. More oocytes, better stimulation, 
Of course, in my setting, a bit more expensive because the antagonists cost a lot of money. But I know here in India, they are very cheap. So it's not so much. And the results are much, much better. The other advantage is that when the patient has to start, she has to start on day one of the cycle. And then she contacts you and she has uh, the first day of the bleeding and then uh, stops. And then she doesn't know if it's really day one. And maybe it's not day one. Maybe tomorrow is day one. If you start these two, three days of antagonist before, it doesn't matter if she started bleeding, yes or no. She will start during these days when you give the antagonist. And then you can start on day five with a clean sheet, low estradiol, low progesterone, a nice wave of follicles together with the stimulation. And it works better. One question, Dr. Peter, I had. Uh, what if we give, should we give OC pill or a luteal estrogen protocol for uh, the previous cycle? And can we start stimulation three days after the last OC pill without waiting for the menses if you're planning a frozen embryo transfer cycle or a cyst cycle? Well, you can, you can do that. There's no problem at all. We don't like the OCP pill. We don't like it. One, because they're infertile patients and it's a bit contradictory to give the pill. But well, that's another uh, psychological uh, thing. But secondly, the OCP pill suppresses LH. And we're talking about LH and this is not good news. And it suppresses the whole system. When you give the OCP pill and then you do a stimulation, you get always less oocytes than if it is in a normal natural cycle. We looked up all our studies and we did a lot of studies in the unit with OCP pill and without OCP pill and we always found a constant 10% lower pregnancy rate if the patient had OCP pill. And so we don't like it. It does something, it suppresses for sure. And personally in my, when uh, in the donor cycle, oocyte donation cycles, usually they are on the pill these girls because they don't want to be pregnant. Uh, I try to get a washout period, which is as long as possible. So in an oocyte donation cycle, I routinely, I don't care about when they have their period. They stop the pill. Five days later, they start for three days with an antagonist, like I mentioned already before. And then I do a blood test just to show and just for research reason. And then I start a stimulation. So from the last pill till the beginning of the stimulation, we have eight days washout. And usually then all this building is out. We have beautiful LH levels and they produce much more oversight than they're still suppressed by the food. I don't like this thing. And what would you suggest? The, yeah, the, yeah, for the yeah. other one, you mentioned the sodial value rate in the yeah. ritual phase to program things a bit. Uh, yes, it works very, very well. Uh, my colleague uh, Christophe Locale uses it uh, in the unit uh, and it works well. I use for my programming these antagonists before. They do T4, I can go to five, six, so I can also program my things. Mm -hmm. It's more expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, he says I'm the expensive man and he's the cheap man. Okay, fine. But I have an advantage that by giving this antagonist, you get more all sides because you get these two waves together. With the sodial value rate pre preparation, you don't have these two waves together. That doesn't work. But doesn't that suppress your LH more, giving antagonist on day two, three, four? Yes, it suppresses a bit, but it's not too long. And then you have a five days where there is no suppression at all. So things recover again. Uh, the next question is, what is better in a PCO stimulation, HMG or FSH and why? <laughs> That's uh, two minutes, well, five minutes. Uh, we did, uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit older, but when I was young at the university, they told me all, PCO patients, they are full of LH. And the question comes from there. Eh, you know, you're talking about ACG, uh, Menopur, it's full of LH. You're not going to give this to PCO patients who are already full of LH. You know, the whole misery of the world is blamed on the high LH levels of these PCO patients. They're infertile, they have a bad skin, they have miscarriages, they have abnormal cycles. You know, all the bad things of the world is because of this endogenous LH that are very, very high. Okay. So for stimulation, ovulation induction, usually in these patients, what you should you do? Well, of course, you know, FSH, pure FSH, not going to put again LH on there because it's already very high and it's already a bad thing. Well, we did a study, I didn't show this study. We did an ovulation induction study long time ago. Uh, low dose step up. We had 100 PCO patients where we did recombinant FSH. 
100 PCO patients where we did menopur, HMG, full of ACG, so full of LH. And they started 75 units, it didn't work, half a dose more, and then up to up. If there was one or two follicles, then ACG, and then uh, intercourse or insemination, and then we checked for ovulation rates and for pregnancy rate. The results were big surprise. The results were exactly the same. If you did pure FSH or an HMG, ovulation rate, pregnancy rate is exactly the same. So this thing about endogenous LH and then giving ACG with menopause, it does not matter at all. It works as well, exact the same result. But we realized that the cancellation rate with the recombinant FSH was 8%. So 8% of the patients who receive recombinant FSH, the clinician said, oh, oh, stop. We're not going to do anything here because there are too many follicles. There's a risk of hyperstimulation or there's a risk of too many babies because there are five, six follicles. Stop, we cancel, and we're going to do again. In the menopause group, it was less than 1%. And why is this? Well, the reason for that is the content of this ACG. If you give this ACG in ovulation induction, you have the small follicles that normally start growing all together. You have a lot of small follicles because of this ACG going to atrophy. And a few follicles, they start growing, they become intermediate follicles and then big follicles. When you give pure FSH, you don't have these small follicles that go into atrophy. They all grow. And suddenly you have a lot of intermediate follicles, a few big ones, and then you have more risk that at the end of the day, you have to say, look, my lady, you came many times here, you spend a lot of money for this ovulation induction, for these expensive drugs, but we're going to cancel everything because I'm not going to take the risk of multiple pregnancies and hyperstimulation. The patient is not happy. Next time you go to another doctor who is better in the stimulation than you. And that's what we saw. So in fact, it's a safer drug, there's less cancellation, and overall, the results are the same. Another question is, what was the dose used in this study? I think you mentioned 75 IU is... For the from, ovulation induction. Yeah. Ovulation induction, we start low dose low step dose. up. 75, then 112.5, mm -hmm. then 150, and then always with half an ampoule, we went up. Standard one. That is for uh, IUI and timed intercourse and not for an IVF cycle. No, no, that's not for This is low dose ovulation induction, no IVF. Here. Another question, Dr. Peter. Uh, we've been uh, now the research is going more on the luteal phase. Yeah. I see in one of your studies saying that you use progesterone as uh, the antagonist, I mean, uh, to suppress LH. And then you trigger with a GNRH agonist yeah. and a low dose HCG. So, yeah. what, what dose are we using? In these cases, we trigger with 1,000 units of HCG. Yeah. Because we, we saw some studies that the lowest that you can use HCG as yeah. a trigger is 3,500 IUs. And then HCG will have like two effects. One is an oocyte maturation, yeah. and second is to support your corpus luteum. Whereas I don't want that support function as of now. I just want the maturation as of now. Exactly. So what is the lowest dose? Is 1,000 effective in your... Uh, Maturation or it's just supporting the corpus luteum? It's difficult. We try to look at this lowest dose, uh, the, the 3,000. I think it's 3,000 yeah. that you can trigger with. Um, in all our oocyte donors, now since we know about this problem with agonists and suboptimal uh, retrieval and even no oocytes at all, now we routinely combine the two 1,000 units of ACG and the agonist trigger. And we give 1,000 units. Up to now, I'm touching, touching wood. You didn't have any hyperstimulation yet. Mm -hmm. Donors say after this that they feel more pain than if you give an agonist only. Because this, you know, these ovaries, they stay swollen for longer than if you give an agonist only. What I do if the patient or the donor has really a lot of follicles, 40, 50 follicles, then I'm really a bit scared, then I have to 500 units ACG. And it works also well and I didn't have any hyperstimulation as yet. What is the lowest, lowest, lowest one? I cannot tell you yet. Yeah. Maybe 250 will be also okay, but I don't know. Uh, I don't want to take the risk to go lower because maybe then I will be back in the old fashion 
that uh, we get suboptimal response and we didn't get any oocytes, etc. Et et but up to 500, you can go. Yeah. So has the incidence of suboptimal in EFS going down? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, because we also face this yeah. problem, like every month we'll have at least five or six patients who would not respond. And then we started checking uh, serum LH levels, 12 hour post trigger. Yeah. But majority would have more than 20 levels. Some patients do have a levels of 12, 15. These are then, the problems. Yeah, these are the yeah. problems. But that's what my question is. Is 1000 IU HCG protecting you from all these untoward events? Yes or no? Uh, up till now, I must say yes. We didn't have any suboptimal response since then. And we started now one year to do this routinely. Everybody has it routinely and we didn't have any any problems as yet as we had before so i think thousand is enough okay but in the really really at risk ones i i give 500 okay. it doesn't happen so much because we, we are quite soft with the, with the donors but a few times we have to do it like that up till now no problems at all but this is not a big study huh? yeah. it's just yeah. personal experience we, we can do it in a big way right? I, I, yeah <laughs> well yeah yeah i think uh, when you use an agonist as a trigger yeah. you have to combine the two and yeah. freeze all. I think that's what you do. Yeah. Starting fiddling around to do still a fresh transfer and, and starting to give this patient progesterone and so diet by the way, and low doses of ACG and all the things. This is a waste of time. You don't get the good result as if you just freeze. And yeah. you have to make the patient at risk of hyperstim anyway. Yeah. Uh, next question. Uh, in antagonist protocol, especially with a high BMI, we sometimes face premature ovulation. Does that mean the dose of antagonists in different BMI patients should be different? Well, that's a good question, and it's true. Huh? There is a, a clear relationship between BMI and antagonists. Uh, there are studies of that published. Uh, the higher the BMI, the efficacy of the antagonist is going down. I tell my patients who are really obese, maybe we should not do these patients for IVF, maybe we should put them on a diet first and then take them over. But I tell them that there is a risk because of the severe morbid obesity, and I think we see more of these patients than you here in India, uh, that there is a risk of uh, premature uh, ovulation because the antagonist doesn't keep it. Uh, thing. You have to keep an eye on it. Um, it, is, it is like that. So what you have to do, increase the uh, antagonist. This is one option, uh, but you have to be careful because if you if the dosage of antagonists is very, very high, you really block your LH and you not have any LH at all. The alternative in these patients is to use, what I showed, the uh, progesterone suppression, because there you block the hypothalamic uh, release and you will not have any, any uh, uh, ovulation at all. If you have patients where you really want to do, even in a long protocol, some of them, they ovulate. If you have this sort of patients, it doesn't happen often, but it happens, and you want to get, you know, to get it right, try this progesterone protocol. She will not ovulate. All right. Uh, I think that was the last question. Uh, I again want to thank uh, Dr. Peter, uh, Peter Plateau for the excellent presentation and the nice way in which he answered all our queries. And once again, uh, a big thank to Fering for organizing this uh, uh, lecture for exclusively for all of us. I think a lot of uh, queries got solved. Uh, in case you have further queries, you can start uh, pushing me on email and I'll <laughs> definitely route it to Dr. Peter for answers. Uh, thank you all. Thank you once again for joining uh, and hope to have these interactive sessions a lot more in future. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks very well, Mr.